HBCU Dodgers Radio, Dodgers After Dark. Welcome back to uh, in-depth conversation with young alumni of historically black colleges and universities. Packed show tonight. Really, really packed. We got Ors the Morganite, uh, Tay and uh, Tay from Hampton, um, because we got a new name, Una from Instagram, um, also known as HBCU Palante. Uh, Winston get him in the school. Uh, line brother Katie and frat brother Eric. So we got a yo, yo. we got a really packed show tonight. A lot of headlines today. Um, some were unexpected, uh, so we may change course in the middle of the show. Let's start. Uh, former presidential candidate Michael Bloomberg donates hundred million dollars <laughs> to HBCU medical schools. Uh, so this is going to eliminate debt for students at Howard Howard's Medical School, Meharry Medical School, uh, Morehouse College of Medicine, and Charles Drew. Uh, wait, 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 wait! We have to clarify to. To three, to HBCUs three HBCUs and a, and a predominantly and one PBI and a predominantly black institution. You are correct, bro. Um, do you guys see that paying off student debt is the new wave for HBCU philanthropy? Because this is what two years, two times in the last three years, where somebody has come forward and said, "I'm going to pay off all of your debt." Is that the new? Is that the new give to an HBCU wave? Because there was a lot of questions around that with Morehouse. Are they really giving it to the school? Which in turn they did do. They did funnel the money to Morehouse and then Morehouse, which got credit for the gift, then paid off folks debt. I don't know the particulars of this one, if they're going to give it to each of these schools and then they'll pay off the debt that way. But is this the new wave to say, let's eliminate debt? What do you guys think? Hey, it has to be for us because we had one of our a situation you know he was as a result of that donation he didn't have any debt and he gave and in turn gave some of that money to morehouse and in turn he's being able to help other young men who want to go to morehouse as well from our program mm -hmm. as a result of that of that gift so it's definitely a conversation i'm like I, I mean, it's easy to say to a young person look at these institutions where historically that's something that happens so your investment is going to be even greater on top of what you get from the education and the experience you also have an opportunity that you may be able to graduate from said institution debt free which allows you some freedoms and some abilities to be able to do things you wouldn't normally do so it absolutely i think i hope it's a way i sure hope it's a conversation going forward that folks can say this is a way we can invest in historically black colleges and universities is to help eliminate debt for these students who are going through there especially because we know i think there's a there's a uh, i'll just say from my perspective i don't know about global but in conversation of you're gonna if you go to HBC you're gonna be in debt you're gonna have to choose you don't go, they're too expensive none of them are in Michigan anyway it costs too much money to go away so just being able to eliminate barriers like that and have a real conversation about opportunities that exist when you make that choice it absolutely is a valuable uh, tool and conversation piece and I hope that the wave is people folks considering to do that more if they're gonna make that investment hey we can do it this way and here's the benefit of doing it that way. Ona, your shirt says that you have multiple degrees and zero chill. What would it have meant to you on your doctorate journey to, to wake up one day and somebody tells you, hey, you know what? This doctorate, we, it's, that's on us. What, is that, what does that do for your career? What does that do for lifestyle? What, is, what does it change about your, your, your academic pursuit? She's on mute. I forgot. She can't find the button. Multiple oh degrees, my. multiple degrees on mute. Oh no! <laughs> oh no! Well, let me. Uh, I, while she finds the button, let me see who's not on. KD. Uh, Go. Most of your stuff was paid for. Is that true? Military? No. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> Y'all gotta remember, I stopped going to school midway through. Okay. And then came back. Um, so the second half, yeah, I had a lot of it paid for. Um, but. It, I hope this is the way. Look, I hope that you know somebody gives Cotton State University a gift to just the um the nursing program, right? Mm -hmm. So now you send all of these working professionals into the field with no debt. That gives them the opportunity to travel and um buy houses and and, and and invest in the area in which they got their education, which doesn't really happen right. often, right? I just hope it's the way. That's all I got. I mean, it's nothing to be angry at. It's it you know any any win for HBCU is a win for me. That's all I got. Taylor, what do you think? Um, I think really talking about the wave, I think it's the wave also now because it part of the larger conversation of student and college debt across the nation. And so I think 
it's even i think it's the wave as we talk about higher ed in general as we're talking about debt and as we're talking about um just folks in general and like how much they are um having especially in med school so as someone who works at a med school and works at one of the more expensive med schools like across the country i see how debt impacts medical students i see how it um, can hinder whether folks want to choose to go into certain residencies um, deciding if they want to be a black surgeon because a surgery residency is longer than um, you know other residencies so you know figuring out when we talk about like when how are we increasing um, black doctors debt elimination is one too but even thinking about the process after when they go into um, their residencies how are we assisting them with that so i also think a lot about um travel so i am excited at the fact that we're eliminating debt but i also want to then bring it to the conversation about how are we supporting students um currently while they're in it when i learned how much folks are spending to fly to residency interviews when i learned about how students um how much they're paying for lodging um one of my students i know they paid 12 grand and that was outside of their tuition and everything that they paid for just what? for them to interview for residency programs. Out of pocket? You know, they like found money, extra loans, you know, That's some of it might have been out of pocket, but you know, wow. again, when we're talking about that conversation, yes, I going even back to Katie, like, yes, eliminating debt is very important, but how are we also helping them like not accrue it while they're in it? So yes, eliminate the debt. Well, now I'm really also thinking about like, okay, so how are we assisting when they're flying to residencies mm -hmm. what are the partnerships we're having with hotels that maybe can house um black students from medical programs so they don't have to foot a whole entire bill what are like programs where it's a house the student program so so i think a lot about that so yes i'm excited Excellent. eliminate the debt but let's have those other conversations those other too calls. About it. let's get back to una real quick i think she's she's back in let me see if this 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 multiple degrees and mute button works so how does that how does that change your 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 lifestyle or your lifestyle choices doc when when you know that it's paid for i mean i was i had the opportunity to get mine for free mm -hmm. um so i took it but i know several others who didn't and they don't and you have that cultural void right like who looks like me and can tell me how to get to this place that i'm going to mm -hmm. the last time that i saw somebody that looked like me was when i was at norfolk state once i got to where I got my doctor from, I was like, I had to search for somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and when you when you have that experience, it's like it's a turn off. You don't want to. I mean, there were several spaces where I was told I wasn't going to finish. And I was like, you don't know where I come from, so I'm going to finish. Mm -hmm. But what that means is that I they're not going to necessarily assist me with the funding. Mm -hmm. So I have to find somewhere else to get the funding. I have to lean on sorors. I have to lean on um, the, the network of that that I have with um, other HBCU graduates, just a lot of things that go into it. And there are people who didn't finish it. You know, they're ABD. They're all but dissertation. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it came down to money. So, yeah, that would definitely make a difference. And we need it because we need other people that look like us to assist us. Not to say that I'm worried or concerned, because I don't want to make it seem like this is a negative. But do you think that gifts like this, especially because of the amount when you see a Robert Smith paying off a whole graduating classes student debt, when you see Michael Bloomberg paying off a whole graduating classes extenuating debt, that that's a trend that will start. And we are in the middle of a, of a trend for giving to HBCUs, but do you think that they will go in one direction and will forget some of the other areas of need that the students have? Is that, a, do you think that that's a concern or is I'll start with you? Um, I would say it, it could be. I think that a, a larger issue is that the amount of debt these students have to take on to start with. And so in some ways, obviously, given to the schools in the front end, and I hate to be the boogeyman about this, but these schools still get a lot of money and it doesn't decrease the cost of attendance. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, be it be it large schools or, or small schools. I mean, John he, Bloomberg gave Johns Hopkins a billion dollars and their tuition has not gone down. Correct. So I, I think that it's, a really important kind of and funny a buddy of mine who actually went to Morgan it works for Josh Hopkins endowment now he's an endowment investment analyst so it's just funny because 
the way that schools are hoarding money the same way that companies hoard money or split stocks or do a bunch of different things um, or buy back stock, it's the same way the universities operate. So I think that paying off debt helps students a bit more, but I don't know if there's a lot of dialogue about what are schools doing to reduce the cost of attendance and mm-hmm. how are these donations trickling down to the rest of us? Because again, paying off one graduating class's debt is nice, but how many people in that graduating class are going to you know, give all this money back? Maybe maybe a lot more than normal, but still it's not affecting the thousand students at that school versus if we're able to lower the cost of attendance. And I don't think that schools are really trying to do that. I think that they're using this money to recruit and market to more students and then obviously to fulfill and satisfy their endowments to do more capital projects or, or you know, increase uh, faculty pay, so forth and so on. I hate to be the boogeyman about it, but I just, I just really don't see, I don't really don't see this. I don't see the schools doing what I believe their part is. Eric, we'll give you the last word on this. So this was to medical schools and we've been having this conversation for the better part of what, like three or four months now about, you know, these elite HBCUs getting these gifts. At least today, at least today on the Twitter, nobody's saying that. I think because there's a concentrated effort to say these are medical school support funds. Uh, Do do you think it falls into that category or, you know, are we going to is that going to surface? I mean, there's two different sides. Like we can address the conversation the same way. I tried to address that last one, a way that many people that have been on this uh, podcast have tried to address it, which is the schools get discussed get described as elite because they do elite things like that's just is what it is right like the the reputation of those you know three plus one medical schools speaks for themselves right i have i have i have a friend of mine who actually went to charles drew right and i can speak to it you know doing what its purpose actually is right so i think for the most part it's not necessarily on the radar like if I was being optimistic, it's because oh well, people this is like okay, we well, you know what it's a medical school, it's not really a big deal. If I was being pessimistic, it's because nine times out of ten, their school doesn't have a medical school, so that concerned effort that wasn't going to get to their school anyway. But mm-hmm. uh, overall, I, I, I mean, I do think that you know to Orz's point, there is a wider conversation about how the money is being utilized in decreasing tuition there's a big thing in higher education about tuition discounting that levels we don't know about but yep. that also impacts the how how much people pay the attempt to go to school there i mean we the elephant in the room is that you know most of our schools don't have the endowment to engage in the tuition discounting on the level of many of of you know white private institutions because the cost that is advertised many of the students are not paying to go there beyond scholarships endowments uh and other funding so it's it's just on it's really just on the on the doorstep of a a larger issue of the cost of higher education which you know to everybody's point costs are are going down no matter how much money these schools are getting Hmm. it's a worthwhile conversation man and i think that 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 part of it is that we're you're in the middle of a public health emergency and so i think that there's a lot of legitimacy in saying yo we need more doctors period but it's a good look to have more black doctors because black folks are disproportionately affected by this dangerous virus. And when we come back, uh, we're gonna take a quick break, but when we come back, we're actually gonna continue on that subject um, with a really, really heavy topic about two HBCU presidents who are actively participating in COVID-19 medical vaccine trials. That just at the dark, we'll be right back. That is at the, that is at the dark and we're back, uh, continuing the conversation. Um, on the health, public health and medical tip, uh, we just wrapped up a conversation about uh, Michael Bloomberg's gift uh, to pay off the student debt at, for students at several uh, historically and predominantly black medical schools across the country. And we continue that conversation with a, a big, big headline. Uh, two presidents, two HBC presidents, uh, Dillard University President Walter Kimbrough and Xavier University of Louisiana C. Renault Verrett uh, revealed today that they are, are participating, the two of them, uh, in a coronavirus vaccine trial. Uh, so they have actively been injected with the vaccine or the the uh, the pilot uh, for a vaccine. And both have said that they are doing well so far. And they took the opportunity to, to talk about their experience to encourage other black folks in the campus communities to also participate specifically because of the disproportionate rates by which African-Americans are suffering from the virus. So around the horn what do you guys think about there's two sides to this what do you think about those two gentlemen specifically doing it 
as HBCU presidents. And what do you think black America's position at this point in 2020 in the middle of a pandemic is to medical trials, knowing our history, uh, Tuskegee experiment, you know, Gila Lax at, at Johns Hopkins, which got brought up uh, and, and a lot of atrocities that have been committed against black folks in the name of medical science. What do we think about HBCUs being at the forefront of a potential vaccine that could could help black people uh, who, again, are disproportionately uh, suffering from this virus? Taylor, we'll start with you and your shade. I don't I didn't have any shade at all. Um, <laughs> I don't have any shade. I'm actually not being shady tree tonight. Um, I think one of the things for me is that I'm always at a crossroads whenever we talk about um, vaccines when we talk about um, health of black folks and medicine, because as we talk about the historical implications and aspect there, I think it's important that when we talk about being at the forefront, like we define what forefront means. Mm -hmm. And so forefront doesn't mean that HBCU stakeholders, we all need to be taking a vaccine. It can mean that we're at the forefront of how the transparency about this is being um, done. We can be at the forefront about how we are communicating and how we're even educating our HBCU stakeholders, our staff, student, faculty member, alums of our HBCUs about the entire process so that we as black folks can make the best informed decisions for ourselves. So when I think about how are we going to be in the forefront, I think about how are we disseminating this information? How are we being transparent? How are we talking about the fears and aspects behind it? And also how are we going to ensure that we do not shame each other to either do it or don't do it. Because I think my biggest thing is, I think we have a responsibility as um, folks in the HBC community and especially the two presidents to not necessarily shame or to put a guilt space on that we need to be saving ourselves without recognizing that some folks cannot take it because of like health conditions, because of things of that nature. And so being at the forefront also, I believe that we need to be in the space of how are we providing the best and the most accurate information for us as black folks to make the decision ourselves. Is, I don't want you to do a symbolism to like tell me like, oh, I'm your president. So now you definitely know that you possibly could should be. I'm making you feel like you need to take it. No, empower me to make the decision because you've given me the information to decide if this is how I'm going to be a part of the forefront of this vaccination and healing our community. Uh, or is, what do you what do you say about that when the HBCUs have a lot of power, a lot of cultural resonance to make that call, at least to get black folks in the conversation about participating. But some, like a lot of our citizens and a lot of our community members are nervous and reasonably so about being involved in it. Um, I would say it's, it's probably fair to say that it can work in some areas and not in others. They can't go to Tuskegee University with the the vaccine trial. It's just not going to work. <laughs> I like, don't mean to laugh, but you, I mean I'm just being serious. So they can't. Exactly. <laughs> they can't. They can't come to Morgan or Coppin because right. Henrietta Lacks is like again. It's very, very, very close to the to campus community. Right. So it's funny. I just watched Project Power on Netflix, which mm -hmm. is very like scary to talk about this right now. That both HBCU presidents in New Orleans are taking this vaccine, <laughs> and we just saw. I'm, I'm just saying, like, art imitates life in a sense. In a sense, right. And so when you think about all these different things, it's just like, would I personally want to take it? No. But I do know that from what the CDC has said, the way they're going to put the vaccine out, they're going to start with, like, frontline healthcare professionals and then cycle down. I know I went to a school with the pharmacy school. So did Taylor and Una went to a school with the pharmacy school. So maybe it's good to start places like Hampton, like FAMU, um, like Xavier, um, where they do have a certain level of, um, I would say, community buy-in. Like, fam, I know I don't know about right. Hampton, I'm sure they do, but mm -hmm. but like FAMU has a big um, presence, especially the pharmacy school in the community. They do a lot of like free HIV checks. They do a lot. All the pharmacists who are in the school work with the community with their, especially with HIV, mm -hmm. um, a lot with HIV in terms of antiviral medicines and educating the community. So they have that type of cultural um, um, trust there. So maybe start there. Is there legitimately anything that that the medical community or the CDC or any kind of organized body could say that would make black and brown people feel like, all right, I'll I'll, I'll give it a shot. 
nah. <laughs> right. Like, period. Like, nah. Because it's, it's, there's too much history there. Right. Um, I listened to um, Minister Farrakhan when he spoke, and he specifically said, don't. Um, my paternal cousins are our members and they they you know I'm not and they definitely were like yeah we're not we're not until somebody in our community that we trust makes the vaccine mm. and then test the vaccine we are not going to be a part of that and you won't either okay <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah no I, nah there no it something else has to go there there needs to be a bridge there and I don't I don't know how to build it but there's one in Brooklyn that I'm selling. <laughs> so, so that's an excellent point, actually. And so, Eric, do you th- do you feel like the CDC and uh, you know the White House or you know the NIH should should be more active in saying, "Hey, HBCUs, be more involved with the clinical trials." Uh, I believe the government should take an active role, and more specifically, the CDC should take a more active role in finding out how they can start to at a higher rate higher a lot of these stem majors that are coming out of hbcus mm-hmm. so that these are the people who are doing the research so that these are people who we actually who actually have some type of connection to the community where they where they can actually sit here and say this thing that we're doing is going to be okay for our people i'm not talking about putting out a token this, that that's just a, a face that you could say that oh this person looks like you and he's talking about things I'm talking about no this person was in the lab he was running the test he was doing everything like that we know our schools produce a lot of black doctors mm-hmm. a lot of black researchers black pharmacists we know our schools do these things so my question is now if the CDC or the government came to me along the line saying oh we need HBCUs to now get people more active my question is who do they have on their end that has any insight to the black community on a real consistent basis that they can actually like convince us that is something safe to do who was involved because they'll tow out a black face real fast and not even consider anything black like like prime example like this would be common knowledge and I can't say that this will happen because these are mostly intelligent people but if the vaccine has a negative impact on people who have sickle cell disease, mm-hmm. did anybody in your lab consider the fact that you're trying to push into a black community that is more often impacted, like impacted by sickle cell genetically, like just numbers wise, right? Mm-hmm. It's little small things like that where if you don't have somebody who has any type of multicultural competence in the research that they're doing, then why should we trust them moving forward to do anything? Mm-hmm. And to Eric's point, um, Yes, they should be building that trust. And I would suspect that folks in, in CDC and NIH would look back at us and say, OK, fine, take it. Don't take it and die. <laughs> you know, what I mean, like, is, is that is that a trade off? Like you can you can not participate and and then now look at you, you know, six months from now. Like there must be we got to talk about the elephants in the room. We got to talk about historical issues. We got to talk about why people might be reluctant in this space to address this. If there's any positives that can be that can come out of it, I think Eric's point about real life partnership and representation. So like having people at Xavier, at Howard, you know, at our institutions who are on the ground level with research and understanding to be able to infuse their knowledge to these communities and have people get a real life understanding and in turn also address some of the historical issues or concerns that people might have. That's a real way as opposed to kind of like. not that there's anything wrong of what they're doing, but I think that may not have been the the best initial way to address the historical issues that exist in this space, and especially in the middle of a pandemic, how touchy that is with what we're dealing with and what we've dealt with historically. If you lead it from a perspective of, hey, we've been partnering with these institutions, you know, building masks and doing research and, you know, talking talking about all those elements and having them who already have those real relationships with the communities and with the people who look like us, to Eric's point, not just for the sake of tokenism, but real life application, real life relationships to be like, oh, these are people I can talk to. Katie, the last word is on you. What do you think about what do you think about the politics of this? Because there's a lot of political discussion around Trump wanting to force the issue on a vaccine before the election. What do you think that that comes in? Because black folks are paying attention to that to that BS, too. Do you think that that comes into the, the consideration of, you know, should we trust this thing or should we not? 
And then politically, what do you think it may mean for the, the presidents who are participating? Um, not necessarily from an election or something, but just the clout or the lack thereof or the credibility that they will have with their their students, their alumni for openly discussing that, hey, we're a part of this. Um, fascinating question. Um, as far as the politics go on the, from the federal level, uh, I don't know if it has an effect at this point because there's so much distrust in the federal government. And I, that's I think that's what everyone is speaking to in this particular case no one trusts the federal government right now and that's so unfortunate because we actually need them to lead the way this is a national issue you mm -hmm. want a national response team but you don't have that right now and um it's just interesting to me like in this case because i don't know how many people are parents in this chat besides jared that we draw the line at this vaccine mm -hmm. because uh i know jared's kids are vaccinated right they're not getting polio <laughs> right, they not. <laughs> I Measles, haven't seen them with the pox. Right, right. You know, like <laughs> you know what I mean. So it, I understand the distrust and the discord about vaccines in general, but it's like at some point, black people have to check in this game and, and, and understand that it's not a black people issue. Like distrust in the medical community is not a black person thing. Right. Uh, point of reference: back in the eighties and nineties, doctors decided not to involve women in trials for breast cancer research because they felt like men and women were the same except they had breasts which is just stupid right from a common sense aspect but that's literally how they thought mm -hmm. so um you know it, it, at some point you know our folks just need to just all right there are black doctors out there right <laughs> they are leading the way in these conversations like let them talk like listen to them Dodgers After Dark, and we're back. Uh, so another big headline which surfaced earlier this week, uh, a Maryland lawmaker has proposed that uh, three out of Maryland's four historically black institutions, which are currently in the university system of Maryland, uh, leave the system uh, to, to, in his words, have more autonomy and a better chance to lobby for more funds, to create uh, more competitive programs, uh, and to exist without the political pressure of being in a system that includes the state's flagship, the University of Maryland College Park and other institutions that are growing uh, within the system. So uh, I'm, of course, going to start with our, uh, our Maryland brothers uh, who, who either attended Morgan or Coppin, um, whom those of us this directly affects. Uh, Katie, what do you think about leaving uh, since Coppin is actually in the system? Morgan is not. Uh, <coughs> but, but what do you think about Coppin, Bowie? UMES and Morgan essentially just mm -hmm. being state affiliated schools with our own boards. <laughs> Part one. Cop and staff is technically state employees. Right. So now you're stripping state benefits and their retirement packages from not, necess how... not necessarily. So let me let me say this because yeah. Morgan is state affiliated. We're not in the system, but they do they are state employees. So they do yeah, they do get to they do get to participate in the in the benefit system and be invested in retirement and all that. So that hopefully, hopefully that would stay the same. But it's to your point, there could be changes if they say, oh, y'all want to leave? Okay. <laughs> right. Right. So I'll worry about the staff, right? Because mm -hmm. that's your anchor. Mm -hmm. And then I, why are you trying to avoid paying the stand bill? Correct. <laughs> like at some point, just cut the check and stop playing with us. If you just cut the check, we wouldn't have half the problems that we had. Exactly. But it just seems like they're talking around cutting the check. And it's always our fault why they won't cut the check. You grew Towson with no tangible evidence that that, would, that investment would be worthwhile. 20,000 plus right? students. Um, why can't you do the same for, for Bowie, Morgan, and UMES? Mm -hmm. And then Coppin? Why, just, why, why not? I just don't understand it. And then if you separate us, then that means we're cut out of the, the impact conversations. Yep. And so now you're changing state standards without our say-so. Yep. And then how, what does that look like for accreditation? Mm. Right? I, you know, it, it, it's, a lot, it's a slippery slope that I'm just not willing to cross. No, we'll stay. Or if, I, if, I, if we stay. Or is, what do you think about it? Because here's the thing. I think a lot of alumni in Maryland, just for as best as I know, they would probably cheer this and say, yeah, let's do it. Because they'll think, they'll so think yeah, let's, we'll a, be way better without the white man telling us what to do. 
the white man still going to tell you what to do. (laughs) (laughs) I have a very unique perspective on this because I went to FAMU, which Mm -hmm. is in a state system, which is terrible for the school. Mm -hmm. Um, And then transferring and going to going to Morgan, which is independent. You do notice a difference in how the schools are run, how the administration speaks and how things Mm -hmm. get done. Because the administration at FAM is very much influenced by the governor and by the board versus at Morgan, where the president has a bit more autonomy, it seems. um, And there's more of a relationship with the board, unlike at FAM. So because I went to the only Maryland HBCU that has its own uh, board, I did notice a difference personally going from, from FAMU to Morgan. Though I do believe that it's important that we keep in mind that it might be a good opportunity, you know, for schools to to really build some some more bridges. Um, I think that what, what would be a smarter thing for the um, the state to do is to build maybe a system um, with kind of an oversight and its own board, maybe in Baltimore. Um, and again, I wouldn't want Morgan to be part of that either. But it might be better to make Towson share resources with. Coppin and UB, it, it might be better to to have a Maryland system and then have a um, excuse me, a Baltimore system and then a Maryland system. Be, because keep in mind, like, in other states, in in other states, there are multiple systems. You know, Texas has like four huge systems. Louisiana, yep, um, has several. So Louisiana has multiple systems. Um, Florida will probably have multiple systems soon. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think that North Carolina definitely needs another system. So. Um, I think that when we talk about it, I think in general, Maryland system is too large Uh and it might be better. And again, I don't want to see schools merged, but in terms of governance, it might be good to have a Baltimore Mm. board that's over Coppin, UB and Towson. There might be a better way to allocate resources than have all the other schools be independent because it's going to be difficult for you and me, yes, especially in Coppin, especially to garner resources because they're going to have to compete with Morgan, which is independent as well, and then compete against the system. So it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword. That's my concern, and I'm going to go to Eric on this because as a Winston alum, he knows what it's like to be in a system where you have several public HBCUs, but you're also competing with several large Research One Institute uh, PWIs. So what, what do you think about the conversation from the, the concept of fighting for resources everybody's fighting for resources in a public system right but then when you think about north carolina there's there's just emerged in the last maybe 10 to 15 years a pecking order where it's like north carolina a t north carolina central everybody else no matter how good fayetteville no matter how good winston no matter how good elizabeth city does the the, the hierarchy is clear a t central everybody else so what do you think about that in terms of what the possibilities could be for Maryland if that actually would have come to fruition? So the funny thing about, you know, we mentioned that thing and like, don't be, we, we say the pecking order in North Carolina just started, but it was planned in nineteen. It was planned a long not, time ago. Exactly. I'm not going to get, yeah, I'm not going to get into detail with that. What I do find interesting is the timing of all of this when the Maryland HBCUs were pretty much told to take a sham of a, of a, of a settlement, mm. right? So I'm looking at this. They're saying, oh, we're giving them more autonomy and things that's at the third. Everybody else, everybody else brought up a lot of very valid comments, right? We're talking about them being excluded from conversations that will impact their accreditation. We're talking about them being excluded from the decisions that will ultimately affect their institutions because they're still a public institution within the state. Mm-hmm. I can't help but not, I can't help but couple this with the fact that the, the state system already owes the schools more money than they're willing to pay them out. Mm-hmm. Right, we're supposed to, we're supposed to think that they're really actually pushing or supporting this from a standpoint of schools getting greater autonomy. No, I think what ultimately happens is is that there's more. That means there's a there's a higher cut to spread around the schools that are within the system as far as support and resources. And at the same time, you turn around and you put the school put the schools that are already struggling based upon them being disenfranchised for decades at this point in a position to have to close down. Because what I ultimately see is that. Yeah, Morgan will be fine. Bowie will probably be fine. Coppin is vulnerable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so is you. And and so, so is you. Yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. Right. So we can't sit here like, oh, on time. You just said, like, yeah, okay. I, 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 I hear you, but Salisbury ain't that far from you and me. Yes. 
and, and there's a whole bunch of schools not too far from Coppin. Yep. UB, UMBC. Yep. I, I don't accept, I don't I my trust in the government is very, very limited, especially as it pertains to the state government when in dealings with the HBCUs in the state of Maryland. Taylor, y'all went to uh, to private Hampton. Um, first, do you give a damn about this? Uh, <laughs> outside of not of caring about HBCU. <laughs> <laughs> outside, outside of caring about HBCUs, I, I, obviously. Really you make the St. Louis and me come up out of here. <laughs> I, I forgot the, the Harris though. The Harris though advocacy in you. So yeah, I, I mean, but but from a from a perspective of what does this look like for a community? Um, because you've seen this with Harris, though. What is it? What is it, and what that means to St. Louis and that institution? Mm-hmm. But you've also seen the damage that the state has tried to do to them and to Lincoln. Um, mm-hmm. What What does it mean if 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 the community sees this and says, "Yeah, let's go, let's go, let's go"? That's a good idea, but it may not be a good administrative or financial or political move that you know because of your exposure to, to higher education administration. Right. I, I, when I, as like an outsider, as someone who, of course, didn't attend a Maryland state HBCU or even is from Maryland um, at all, I think one of the things that was a part of the process, um, even with like Harris Stowe and even with Lincoln, just being vocal about the things that are happening is that the ways in which they, am, especially Harris Stowe, involve the St. Louis community to also be in, invested in all of these. Um, I think when we talk about some of the Maryland state institutions, the, the air of transparency with the community um, is not always there. Um, Harris Stowe was very intentional about how, um, at that time when Dr. Warmack was there, about having these conversations about when they meet with the state, um, that you know town halls were happening, where parents, family, and even if you didn't even attend Harris Stowe, but because you are a St. Louis native, Harris Stowe is your HBCU. So for me looking in, um, when we talk about like, how is this involved in the community? I'm like, does the community even believe and understand all the nuances of this and how has these institutions created the opportunity to understand it and how have they not? Mm -hmm. So that's like how I see it from my lens um, and in those ways, because even for Lincoln and sometimes it's difficult because of the landscape of where they're at. They're in, you know, Jefferson, Missouri. That's a totally different community in St. Louis City Mm -hmm. and so even for Lincoln it's a little bit difficult in how they're trying to get the community invested in helping them understand the decisions that they may be making or how the state may be impacting them because Jefferson City Missouri showing the hell ain't St. Louis Missouri because remember St. Louis is actually St. Louis St. Louis USA like we actually are not you know a part of Missouri so we don't even operate St. Louis bias (laughs) <laughs> Damn, I thought Baltimore was the only thing. Uh, uh, see, and I told like y'all that. about black folks talking about I'm not from Maryland, I'm from Baltimore. I don't, I don't, you know. No. It's the end, but not the, it's the DMV <laughs> specifically, not necessarily. We're Baltimore, Maryland. Yeah, oh, not from the DMV. No, I don't Baltimore, know. Baltimore, not the DMV. St. Louis, USA. So, like, you know, get my mail. I mean, <laughs> I mean, don't get it, don't get it twisted, because Norfolk's the same way. I don't. That whole. That whole area down there, like it's like oh, they're not part of no counties. Every single city is its own stand alone city. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. That whole region, Virginia, that whole region, like that. I'm from North Virginia. Is where like you know, Virginia, like <laughs> Virginia has like like 400 independent cities. Like it's it's, it's a weird it's a weird place. It's a weird <laughs> commonwealth. I'm we come together on a collective. Detroit is the same way. Detroit is the same way. You from Detroit? You're not from Michigan. It's you know, completely you, different. You know what's funny? Yeah. I, I'm interested in Winston's take on this because you're in a in a situation where. Does 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 Michigan have multiple systems? Because I will tell you this: it, it seems like Michigan State, University of Michigan, Central Michigan, Eastern Michigan, all that they fight. Damn. They fight like everybody else, and they program you know to 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 siphon students away. Even Wayne State and University of Detroit. So how could explain explain Michigan's higher education landscape? Because there may be some lessons to take from that because of how competitive even those schools are, those PWIs are with themselves to try to attract resources or take away from somebody else. Yeah, no, really, I'll be quite candidly, it's it's University of Michigan and Michigan State and everybody else. Mm -hmm. Like, everybody else is trying to scrape for what they can get. As you see Wayne State trying to create new initiatives to keep students in the city of Detroit and and change wording and put things around. So it's like looking like, you know, you can get a sweet deal if you come up, you just stay on home Mm -hmm. and come with us. You know, they're trying to do it largely their mindset is wrapped around 
you have been Michigan State. If you don't get into one, your priority is one of those two. Mm-hmm. And if you don't get into one of those two, then you start to funnel in other options that are that are in the state that, okay, well, maybe I'll go to Western or Central or Eastern or UAD or Wayne State, you know, but those are not even, it's tough. And then if you're a private institution in Michigan, people don't even talk about private schools and you're, they have their own system of private schools mm. that exist in the state, you know, Kalamazoo College, um, Aquinas, um, some of those other institutions that are not even really in the conversation. Ain't your homegirl Bessie DeVos an advocate for uh, before you start talking about <laughs> Oakland, <laughs> Oakland, <laughs> you know Oakland, Univers- Oakland University. That's another. Yeah, you know, like those things are like afterthoughts. It's like Bessie your DeVos, first thought yes. is Michigan, Michigan State, you know, and then and then it's everything else. So it's they're always and those schools are always trying to find the directional schools in Michigan, the Oaklands, the UADs, Wayne State. They're always trying to find a way to like a hinge to get some students to be like, Hey, we over here too. Like, you know, this is an option. Like if you, you know, if it didn't work out, maybe we can give you this or you can commute. You don't have to live in the dorm. You can go to Oakland and you can drive home or you can go to Wayne State and you can drive home. You don't have to pay for room and board. Like everybody's trying to find a niche, you know, to allow you to be like that third option. If you can't get into one of the big two in the state of Michigan. So I think Maryland would be, you know, I think based. Again, comprehensive about that, like about everybody having to fight, for their own little nugget, like does that really make sense? And it just kind of seems like y'all, like you said, y'all don't want to pay out, like you don't want to cut the check. So that's why we're here, right? right. And, and 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 the one thing that I've noticed as a, as a Maryland State resident, somebody who's voted in the state for the past 12, 13 years or something like that, Hogan for the past six years has been trying to undermine HBCUs at every step of the way. Everybody he appoints has put the target on our back for whatever reason. I, I, I that's. That's just what I gather from it. For whatever reason, he does not want us to stand on our own and you know, or stand with the state. You know what's so funny about that is he is so out of step with the GOP and with Donald Trump in doing that mm-hmm. because Trump couldn't stop saying HBCUs during the convention. GOP has, has put money on a state level into HBCUs because of Trump's lead on this about mm-hmm. saying one of the ways you can convince black folks that I'm quote unquote for them help HBCUs Mm -hmm. and Hogan is so off that path and it doesn't it doesn't make political sense particularly in a state where you got four of them why are you so far away from your party on this like and making him a ton of because because he makes perfect sense he wins exactly at the end of the day at the end of the day the only places in Maryland he doesn't win are PG and Baltimore and Baltimore City? <laughs> no, Baltimore. No, yeah, Baltimore Central City. Maryland, right. Central Maryland in general. Though. He, he went Montgomery he, County. He, he lose no. Montgomery County and Baltimore. He loses County. Montgomery County and Prince George's. Yeah. And, uh, he won, but he 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 was like 50-50 in Montgomery County mm-hmm. in in twenty eighteen. Well, he's not. So, he has nothing else to run for in Maryland, so he's not right. getting the Senate seat. So the question is, does he want to run for president in twenty twenty? He's been uh, wanting to do that, but he's been buying his time. It's Maryland just, will tank him so fast. It's just so weird. No, he would not win Maryland. But it, it, it's just it, it's just no. so weird that it's so weird that his party, even the most racist elements of the party, claim HBCUs, and he's just no. It's, it, it, makes, it, it makes perfect. It makes perfect sense though. The one thing that you can say about the Tea Party is that they're low key the love child of Strom Thurmond. They might love HBCU so much to keep black folks to away keep from black their folks white away. children, right? And like, and you just gotta look at it for what it is, right? Now, Hogan is old Republican. He care about business and money. For him, it doesn't necessarily benefit the state from a financial standpoint to support multiple HBCUs. So defund them. They're not serving what he believes is important. It makes perfect political sense for him as a Republican to do so. Do I agree with it? Absolutely not. But it, it also, literally, it's the dumbest play he could run. But okay, I, it, I hear what y'all saying. It, it, it's the dumbest play, but he wins because he he's more sane than the rest of his party. Well, he wins also because black folks don't get up and make a bunch of noise about it here in Maryland. Oh no, but there's there's, a, there's another reason as to why he always wins. We got to stop having our uh, black people that look like us. Running for county exec and mayor, uh, mayor positions in Central Maryland, and mm-hmm. using it to put <coughs> their own pockets and then get caught up. Mm-hmm. Ooh, Michael Steele, and we go, <laughs> and we go cut, we go cut at that. Um, we're gonna go to uh, a really special segment that I think we've needed to get to for a while, uh, and and I think Taylor is gonna lead this conversation um, with everything that's going on with HBCUs and outside of it. Um, there has to be a time where where alumni, students, faculty, staff, everybody. 
uh, has to invest in some some self care and some attention to your mental well being. So we're going to talk about strategies uh, for for self care for Black folks when we come back. Dodgers after dark. Dodgers after dark, and we're back. We're going to finish up uh, before the smoke detector uh, beeps a little bit more uh, at somebody's crib. We won't name no names. Uh, Taylor, you're going to lead us in a conversation about self care. Uh, in the middle of all kinds of black crises. Yeah, so when we talk about self-care, one of the things that I've been like working with our faculty, staff and students in the spaces of self-care is one, how are we um, decentering whiteness when we talk about self-care? Mm-hmm. And so oftentimes when we talk about self-care, we're trying to talk about the ways in which, you know, how are we trying to heal ourselves from the aspect of like racism, from white harm that has been inflicted on us. But how do we start having a conversation about self-care for the well-being of ourselves? Because what I try to get us to get out of the way of when we only think about self-care when we have it like harm inflicted on us by those of white supremacy and racism, how do we then ensure that self-care is a part of our daily lives? Mm-hmm. So self-care should move away from being triage, but to be an active thing in our lives. A and daily so how do routine. we yeah. uh, Daily routine. So how do we move from self-care being a triage and a response to high levels of stress, high levels of trauma? How do we embed that into our everyday lives as black folks and also decenter it from seeing self-care only from the lens of harm? Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's like when we have the conversation of moving away from theory therapy and being more of well-being and not just because of severe crisis. Like, yes, you can have therapy for crisis. But how do we talk about having self-care outside of that? So there are like several things that I have like people talk about, um, you know, always creating like what is your toolkit of self-care? Mm-hmm. So each and every last one of y'all, like what's your toolkit? Like, Eric, what you what do you do for your self-care? Like, you just be like, it's hitting the fan or it's not hitting the fan. What do you do besides having, you know, washing pots and pans and beeping noise? <laughs> 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 What is your self care, Eric? What's your, what's your self care, Fred? Honestly, uh, it's actually it's kind of been lacking, right? Cause especially mm-hmm. during COVID, I was a lot better before. Um, my thing was typically going to the gym because it's you can't you can't lift effectively while you're mad. You just don't work well out. It don't work out for, for you well. Um, and I didn't guess I didn't recognize how much that was actually an integral piece to my mm-hmm. like health routine or just like my mental health routine because i would go and like i would go work out at like midnight work work up for two hours go home take a shower go to sleep and have like the best sleep and be able to like just get through the week so now i'm just kind of struggling because you can't go right because you can't go and so then it's like how do you rethink your self-care when you have forced notions removed from you so we can't go to necessarily gyms i mean some of y'all can depending on where you want to go. Taylor is not going to any public spaces because Cause care COVID. and because COVID. Cause COVID. Right. Cause it's a pandemic. It's a goddamn pandemic every day. Um, but, you know, thinking about the ways in which if your self-care has been centered around capitalism, if your self-care has been centered around like you wanting to pay for things, having access to things, how do you then create it outside of that? So there's a few apps. So there's an app that I always recommend for black um, folks, black and indigenous people called Liberate. Liberate? Um, yes, okay. Liberate. Like, liberate yourself. Okay. Liberate. Go be free. Um, I notes. Re- recommend that. Um, the great thing about the Liberate app is that it only has black folks and indigenous people who are facilitating conversations to help you heal, um, whether it is around race, whether it's around gender and sexuality, but it provides meditations and also think about it like as like TED Talks too. So there's a free version that I highly recommend. And then there is a paid version if you do want to like opt in to paying. But the free version works just as well. Um, but the thing about it is that it only has um, those who are qualified. And so you can't just be a random person that will go on the Liberate app and like, I'm going to create a session for people to listen to. Mm. Um, they're qualified and they're vetted folks. And then they're black and indigenous people. So I've actually started participating more on social media just for like funny stuff. So Same. her timeline is is uh, crazy. When I saw that that Al Green picture on that Walgreens, I nearly died. <laughs> um, <laughs> like that that that. So looking at social media for for funny things, 
uh, has become a pastime of mine. Yeah, and that's definitely with the social media aspect, especially because like a lot of our information and the way we find out about black death and black harm comes through social, social media. media. Yep. So like people like folks like on your Instagram, you can go in your settings and contr- control if videos will autoplay or not. You can do the mm. same on your Twitter. On Twitter, you can actually go in your set settings and change um, from video autoplay to turn it off. So that, you know, oftentimes, like when you're scrolling, the video automatically plays. You can do that to ensure, like, just kind of stop the triggers and stressors of that. Um, I recommend for folks who are sharing, like, for you to always have a trigger warning. If you are on um, Instagram, to always do that this is sensitive um, content. So, like, so that people can curate their social media to at least have the least amount of harm from, like, those experiences show up. But, like, Self-care also is about like protecting yourself. Mute words. Let me tell you, my mute list long as hell. Really? It is l- l- long as long. Can, I you, will make, mute can you make more more content show up like twerking? Maybe sure. <laughs> <laughs> Reddit is a good space. I wanted to filter like I just want I want to see more twerking. Space, Go ahead. <laughs> this is a space <laughs> space. Ask, ask I mean, you can hashtag it. You can hashtag it. <laughs> You can save on Instagram. You can save your hashtag for it. Um, So for me, funny enough, um, this little composition book right here, Mm -hmm. um, I write down everything that I need to do for the day or the week, right? Just so that I'm not worried about it. And if ever I need some direction, I'm like, man, what the hell am I doing? Let me jump in my book real quick. That tells me what I need to focus on. And then, like y'all say, um, six feet to my right is my rogue fitness rack. So I've been lifting pretty much this entire quarantine since I can't go to the uh, gym because I just refuse, absolutely refuse to visit a gym. And then I still use my old pastimes. I've been gaming for 30 years. So Mm -hmm. just having having more time to play the game. Huh, it's been a blessing for me this year, um, you know. And then again, I talk to my good my people when I need to. That's always been that's always been helpful. True. Sometimes just listening, just to make sure I'm not the only one that's going through what we going through, is, is is good enough for me. You know what I mean? Taylor, you were saying? No, I was the headsets. I mean, y'all look like gamers. Y'all look like y'all. Yeah, we in the game. Yeah. 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 Um, I pay attention to physiological changes. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. What? How do I feel when when certain oh. things happen? How do I um? How do I respond when I hear something? When I see something? So a lot of people ask me, how did I go to the the protest early in the game? and see what I saw, because mm. um, it, was, it was real reckless. Um, I felt like I needed to be there to record. If anybody, you know, it comes up later that somebody needs a recording of what occurred, I was there, I did what I could. It didn't affect me, the, there is trauma there, but that's not how trauma affects me. Mm. And acknowledging how trauma affects you, because people will like to tell you, oh no, this is going to do this, this, and this to you. I ain't that person. And you have to recognize who you are. And that takes some time. You know what I'm saying? Like people, you know, the simplest of things, or why you on social media so much? Cause da, 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 da. I'm curating my social media. I know what I can, if I start reading somebody's post and it says something that I don't want to hear about, I keep scrolling. Mm-hmm. Real simple. Um, playing double Dutch. I mean, you, you ain't got to be on top of each other to play double Dutch. Double so Dutch, still playing double Dutch. Yeah, so I, yeah, your time <laughs> mine does have a lot of playground activity. That's true. Right. I mean, yeah, I need that. I need that. Mm-hmm. Get mommy outside. We play double Dutch. Um, and having, acknowledging my circle, my tribe, making sure that if I shoot them a text, like I do Wellness Wednesday, yeah, sure. I'll text people and be like, hey, Wellness Wednesday, what's going on with you? Mm-hmm. And see what I can pour out of me and they pour in, in, out of me and then they pour into me as well because they're inclined to ask what I got going on. Mm-hmm. And we may not have, I may not be able to fix their problem, but I may have given them something to think about. Quarantine was interesting for me because I've been working remote since 2017. So I'm very used to sitting in the house by myself all day. Um, then I went on furlough, <laughs> which kind of took away right. my time. Um, but no, I, 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 I try to filter what I take in content wise. I don't watch a lot of news. Um, I work out a lot as well. I think just a big thing for me is, is just 
I, I just try to give myself the space to go through whatever I have to go through and then uh, move forward. I think sometimes we have this mindset. We talk about this a lot with, about Chad with Bozeman. Not everyone's built to work through whatever they have going on. Yeah. And sometimes that's more detrimental than others. And he found a way to, to do it. And that was his passion and what drove him. I know for me, like, I'm not productive when something's going on in my mind. So I try to give myself space and time. And funny enough, I also, like, because, again, I was on furlough. And it's funny because I, I have my job back now, which is wild how that kind of came back. But I, I really tried to not stress out about things that were out of my control. Um, and I, I think it, it got me through to a, uh, to a better place. Mm. Winston. So it's interesting for me because my kind of um, self-care things didn't quarantine didn't affect. So for me, I'm all like reading. Um, I'm in wire podcast deep now. I'm way down in the hole with Jamel Hill and them, you know, watching that stuff. Um, that was stuff I would do anyway. So like to like to Or's point, like it didn't really affect me, like as far as going through quarantine and dealing with those things. But those are like my big things: reading and. Um, watching podcasts take my mind off of the day and even the Una's point like kind of pouring into the young people like checking in on them and making sure they're good and kind of being a resource and kind of helping them and just so that they know the ears there that kind of that makes me feel good too and in turn also kind of helping them get stuff off of their off of their chest so um, that kind of helps out a lot and then I've been doing just prison workout stuff push-ups sit-ups you know, for that kind of stuff. Well, I'm not gonna say you can go into prison. <laughs> take them to the man. yard. Take them to the get yard. On, nah. Get on YouTube and ca- ca- catch these boys, man. These boys be doing the crazy. Pl- I've been, I've been trying to get the pull up, the pull up crazy bars in, <laughs> like Jada Kiss. <laughs> yeah, so that's you know just the easy little prison workout. It don't take much space to get done, and that kind of stuff just really. Uh, that's kind of how I've been able to decompress at the end of every day and kind of just you know clear my head a little bit. I think the biggest takeaway is extending yourself grace um, and recognizing that even through this time that we're in, we've never been in this time collectively together. So even how you may have thought your self-care was before, it may not work now. And that's fine. That's perfectly okay. doesn't mean that something is wrong with you. Um, It also means, let's say, extending yourself grace also means that productive for you looks like going to sleep. And, and, and being okay with that. Um, I think learning how to extend ourselves grace during this time is important, and even the community, the communities we operate in. And so how are we gonna learn to extend ourselves grace and move away from those blinds that we may have placed on ourselves that we always have to do? Um, because grace will allow us to actually thrive and grow and be even better without being better. Wonderful show. I appreciate it. Um, stay tuned on IGTV where we're about to talk about the ratchet things we're going to do since ho- uh, homecoming is going to be on quarantine. As usual, thank you guys for listening, uh, for tuning in on HBCU Digest.substack.com and also on Sirius, 140, Sirius XM 142 HBC Radio. I'm proud of Howard University. We'll see you next time. Peace.